So welcome to the Hoddle Lecture, a little earlier than expected, at the 39th uh, International Symposium on Combustion. As you heard, my name is Andreas Neitzler. I'm from Technical University of Darmstadt, and it's my pleasure to be the session chair for this Hoddle Lecture. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Marco Zaldén, who is from Lund University in Sweden. Markus is a pioneer in laser diagnostics in combustion. Markus, I remember you inspired me and I guess many others as well with your ideas and innovations in diagnostics. So thankful I remember our discussions we have had uh, during my visits in Lund many years ago and on occasions um, on conferences like the Gordon Conference, Laser Diagnostics and Combustion. So since I'm in this field, you constantly, I have to say, brought up new ideas to our community, both in linear and nonlinear spectroscopy. And just to name a few, and this is maybe sometimes lost in our memories, um, Marcus was the first to measure O atoms and CO molecules in flames, and he pioneered as well techniques like rotational cars and polarization spectroscopy in high temperature conditions. So Marcus is since 1992 professor in the physics department in Lund. He has been the program director of the National Swedish Center of Combustion Science and Technology, CCOST, a very, I would say, a very, very um, successful center, bringing up a lot of innovations. He was guest professor in TU Eindhoven, but as well honorary professor in several universities in China. Uh, he served as, for our community as chair of the prestigious Gordon Conference Laser Diagnostics and Combustion, but as well as program co-chair of the Combustion Symposium in Heidelberg 2006, together with Steve Pope. And of course, he was as well in the Combustion Institute. He was a member of the board of directors, but as well a vice president for section affairs of the Combustion Institute. Marcus received a number of rewards, and I just name a few over here. Uh, he received twice the prestigious ERC grant, but as well the AXO Nobel Science Award, Sweden. Markus is member of three academies, I just named one. It's the Royal Academy of Engineering Science. Markus, we are looking forward to your talk, spanning the bridge from fundamentals to applications. So the floor is yours. So we'll see if this works. I have my own computer. So, good morning. And thanks a lot, Andreas, for the nice introduction. And thanks also, uh, Benedict and Nils, for the kind invitation to come and give this lecture. Uh, there were a lot of emotions when I got the call. First, I was surprised. I never expected this. Then I was honored. It's very prestigious. And then I was terrified, knowing that there are a lot of expectations on an hotter lecture. And I thought, would I be able to live up to these expectations? So I started early to plan for a structure and a content of the talk. And the first items on the uh, list was not that difficult to come up with. Of course, it should be an introduction. Yes, I have uh, this one. Ah. Uh, background and history. And then I will be give a brief uh, overview of uh, laser techniques and give uh, some examples of Raman scattering and laser induced fluorescence. Uh, for the main part of the scientific presentation, I thought to follow the modus operandus of laser diagnostics in combustion, which we have uh, in Lund. Uh, so here we, you can see that we used to divide the activities into uh, three different parts, uh, still of course very integrated. At the bottom here, we have the generic activities uh, where we, for example, study light matter interaction. It could be how would a spectra look like at 30 bar, uh, 3000 Kelvin. We are studying that not just for fun, it's that condition that we might have in an engine. 
Uh, and then we also develop uh, new techniques and very often we get uh, feedback input from our colleagues uh, in the other uh, areas here. And then uh, in the second level here we want to study uh, phenomena, combustion phenomena. Here we work with uh, colleagues, experts in various uh, the, of the combustion, CFD, kinetics. And we try to sort of provide very high quality data with the precision, high precision and accuracy. And there we can study, uh, for example, pollutant formation, fuel properties, turbulent interacting flows, and high pressure phenomena. And then for the uh, most uh, developed technique and mature techniques, we also want to face uh, reality, uh, real life, and then we want to study uh, combustion apparatus, the principal engines, gas turbines, furnaces, and there we worked in close collaboration with the um, industry. So that completes the outline. Uh, so I will focus on uh, first generic diagnostic activities, and I will describe some new emerging techniques, uh, structured illumination and single-ended concepts. Then uh, the part will be on phenomenolog phenomenological diagnostic activities, uh, where I've chosen to focus on diagnostics related to non-fossil fuel, combustion, uh, solid biofuel, ammonia, and metals, and then looking into industrial practical uh, diagnostic activities with examples from engines, gas turbines, and large-scale bo boilers. And then a summar summary, conclusion, and future. And if I have time, I would like also to uh, share some personal experience on interaction between different disciplines and how collaboration maybe could be optimized, and then, of course, uh, acknowledgement. So why are we using lasers in combustion diagnostics? Well, there are several advantages. Uh, first of all, it's non-intrusive. You can see here, if you introduce the probe, that you can disturb the flame. Then we focus the uh, lasers to small spots, and that define the uh, spatial resolution, which could be very small. We use pulse lasers, nanoseconds, picosecond, femtosecond, which means that we have a high temporal resolution. Many of the techniques are species specific. We can measure, measure in multiplex, uh, which is multi-species, or in multi-points, and we can go to very high temperatures. And the parameters that are uh, most interest are temperatures, uh, rotational temperature, vibration, vibration, vibrational temperature, translational temperature, and electron temperature. Species concentration could be radicals, molecules, atoms, ions. Uh, we can measure velocities, characteristics of particles and surfaces, as well as two-phase uh, characteristics. So then if we go back in history uh, and ask ourselves, when did laser diagnostics in combustion start? And uh, which was the first publication? Well, there were scattered publication in the late 60s. Uh, but it started really in the early 70s. And it's hard to state the first publication. Uh, but the first publication with real scientific impact, I would claim, is this paper published in Science in 1972, Raman Scattering from Flames, authored by Lapp, Goldman, and Penny, all authors from the General Electric R&D Center in Schenectady. That's also where uh, I think at least the first conference, to my knowledge, was held, uh, Laser Raman Gas Diagnostics, which was organized and, and edited by Marshall Lapp and Murray Penny. It was interesting here that there were uh, 47 participants, and 40 came from non-university organizations. So the main players in the 70s came from government, the lab, and industry, both in the US and in Europe. Of course, there were uh, universities already early, but not that much. So if we uh, look into the different techniques, we can divide them into incoherent techniques and coherent techniques. In the incoherent techniques, we have a laser. Uh, we focus that with a lens into the flame or engine or whatever we are interested in. Then we collect as much light as possible with a lens, focus that onto either directly onto a detector or through a spectrograph onto a detector. And here we have, for example, me Rayleigh scattering uh, to characterize particles and also to be able to measure uh, temperatures. Uh, laser induced fluorescence for minor species, uh, laser induced incandescence for uh, suit characteristics, laser induced phosphorescence for uh, surface measurements of temperature, and Raman scattering for uh, major species. 
Then we have the querying techniques, which is based on nonlinear non optics, where we have two or more laser beam, and we cross them uh, into the combustion zone, and out from the crossing point, we have a new beam emerging, which carries information about the temperature and concentration in the crossing point. Here we have, for example, cars, polarization spectroscopy, GNF or mixing, they induced gradient spectroscopy, and stimulated emission. So, uh, laser induced fluorescence is probably the most used and most common technique nowadays. Here we have a tunable laser, excite the molecule or the species of interest from the ground state to the excited state, and then we can uh, get the consequent uh, fluorescence. Here we can measure a lot of species of interest in combustion. That list can be extended by using a two photon LIF process where we put two photons, two photons on top of each other. Uh, this technique has a high sensitivity. We can go down to PPM level. We can image in two and three uh, uh, space, spaces. And we can uh, do a high speed visualization. The uh, main drawback is that it's hard to quantify the results uh, because of quenching, which is the excitation due to collisions. Uh, then there are other species uh, which are not that easily accessible with conventional laser induced fluorescence. For example, hydrogen peroxide, H2, methyl radical, and so on. So how could we possibly measure these? Well, I said that the laser techniques are non-intrusive. That's not necessarily true. We use high-power laser. We focus down to small spots. And then we can introduce uh, photodissociation, which, of course, could be a problem. But we can also turn this into an, oh, sorry, into an advantage uh, that where we can indirectly uh, measure the species of interest by what I call controlled photodissociation. That means that we understand the photodissociation process. And there are a couple of techniques that can be used. For example, photofragmentation laser induced fluorescence, where we have one laser which, which photodissociate the molecule and another which probe the molecular fragment. And then we have laser induced photofragmentation fluorescence, where we have one laser to photodissociate and where the, uh, ready, the species is uh, created, the photofragment, in the excited state, and then which give rise to emission. And just to exemplify uh, with how, for example, hydrogen peroxide can be detected using photofragmentation laser induced fluorescence, we have our laser at the 266, which is used to photodissociate the molecule uh, to create ground state or white radicals. And then these radicals can uh, be detected and probed with a laser at 282 nanometers, which then give rise to emission at 310 nanometers. So in this way, we can visualize hydrogen peroxide, and here is just an example of uh, hydrogen peroxide prior to ignition in an HCCI engine. Then we have Raman scattering, which was one of the first techniques that was used. Uh, this is an inelastic scattering process uh, where we are coupling between the laser frequency and the vibration and rotational frequencies of the molecules. Here we can measure several species at the same time. Uh, we can make species quantification straightforward. We don't have any quenching. And the drawback is that it's a weak process. Uh, we can have problem with stray light scattering and background fluorescence. So normally, only major species are measured in relatively clean frames. And this technique has been used extensively since the early mid 70s, for example, in turbulent flames, leading, yielding temperature and species uh, PDFs. So could we possibly extend the appli applicability of Raman scattering? Well, sorry. Uh, the sensitivity can be induced at least for increased by at least by studying for studying a medium fast time varying phenomena and here we can use a, a high repetition rate laser uh, which gives a very high average power on the order 100 watt and then we co combine that with a multi-pass arrangement where the laser bounces back and forth uh, through uh, you by using curved mirrors and we have a common focus uh, this multi-pass was used already in the, already in the uh, early 70s. But by these uh, approaches, we can come up down to tens of ppm uh, at flame temperature using Raman scattering. Then we have uh, stray light, which is light that deviates from the intended path and may distort the spectrum that conf 
can come from scattering, from droplets, particles in the laser beam, and also from surface uh, reflections. How could we reduce that? Well, we can tag the signal at a certain frequency, for example, by using a, uh, putting a uh, grating in front of the slit to the spectrometer. That then produces a structure with a certain frequency. And the signal photos then will keep this structure through the spectrometer, whereas the stray light uh, will not keep that structure. And then we can use a spatial uh, lock-in technique called Pareto shadowing, where a factor of up to 80 of the stray light can be uh, reduced. Then we might have uh, problems with uh, fluorescence. Uh, and then we can take advantage of this fact that uh, this Raman signal is uh, polarized, where the fluorescence is not. And uh, here we were inspired by the lock-in techniques. We thought that maybe we can use a uh, half-wave plate to put that in the laser beam, rotate that in time, and that also change the polarization of the uh, laser beam. And then also the um, uh, Raman signal will be polarized and we can uh, detect uh, that uh, in time. Uh, so then we can use, sorry, uh, polarization, uh, temporal polarization lock-in filtering technique. And uh, then a factor of 200 of the background could be reduced. Just to show how this can uh, work, we have tested that in a sooty flame, you can see here. And here are the results, these are uh, spectra, Raman spectra, um, raw data uh, as a function of height above the burner. And you can see that you have a lot of background scattering. Uh, it's hard to evaluate any Raman spectra. But then if we use this uh, stray light and the fluorescence suppression technique, we can really dig out the Raman signal and could even uh, measure uh, species concentration uh, in this flame. So then, turning into the generic uh, diagnostic activities, and I'll describe some new emerging technique, uh, structured elimination and single-ended measurement concepts. Uh, normally for 2D measurements, uh, for example, planar laser fluorescence, it's common to use a homogeneous laser beam, ideally producing a top hat intensity profile. But it's also possible to use a laser sheet which is spatially intensity modulated at a certain frequency. And that is what we call structured elimination, and that, that you can see here. Uh, that can be done using a grating or a double wedge glass plate. This was first applied in microscopy to increase contrast by discriminating the out of focus light. And uh, very similarly, this can be used for suppress multiple scattering spray diagnostics using SLEEPY, which is structured laser illumination, planar imaging, and this was developed by the group of Edward Barrical. Uh, more recent development of structured illumination is uh, FRAME, uh, which stands for Frequency Recognition Algorithm for Multiple Exposure, where we can put uh, multiple images at the same time on the detector, separate them afterwards, and that opens up for uh, visualization, uh, ultra-fast imaging, 3D imaging, and multiple species uh, visualization. So just, I will guide you through how this works. This is here, what I would call a normal 2D image in the spatial domain. And if we look in the uh, forward domain, it's focused towards low spatial frequencies. If we now eliminate the same target with a structural laser beam, uh, with a certain frequency of the intensity modulation, then we indu induce new image copies in the forward domain, as can, as can be seen here. And in this case, we have the laser at a certain angle. If we have another laser at another angle, then we create new uh, image copies in the Fourier domain. And then we can have several beams at different angles overlapping on the detector, then separate them in the Fourier domain, and that op opens up for new types of diagnostics. This can be used, for example, for 3D experiments. Uh, 3D imaging has been demonstrated before using, for example, a high-speed laser and a uh, high-speed camera. Here we can essentially do the same using one traditional uh, detector and one uh, laser beam, which is split into uh, different structured laser beam, in this case four. So here we have the four beams uh, coming in at different angles into the flame, which is positioned here. And they overlap in the y-x plane, but they are separated one millimeter in the z-direction. 
So these uh, experiments were uh, performed on uh, formaldehyde, and these are three uh, experiments. Formaldehyde was excited at 355 nanometer. And here you can see what the camera sees. Uh, it's a lot of structures, uh, and it looks chaotic. But then if you go to the uh, forward domain, you can clearly identify the different images. Then you can use a bandpass filter. You can transfer these to origin in the Fourier domain and then do an, apply an inverse Fourier transform. And then you can extract the different layers, different imaging uh, shown here in different colors. And then of course you can use more or less advanced 3D reconstructions to get the uh, nice 3D images. This can also be done for um, high-speed imaging, uh, still measurements of, of formula, form aldehyde. Here we have uh, four pulses with a time separation of 100 microseconds impinging on the flame, still at different angles. And this is what the detector sees. And this is the Fourier uh, transform. And then we can uh, extract the images as described before, and we can get a video and see how this changed in time. Uh, then further application of this is to measure uh, simultaneous species at the same time. We can suppress uh, background in Rayleigh scattering. We can do ultra high speed visualization using, for example, femtosecond lasers, where we can time delay the different pulses and come al al almost to an uh, infinite speed visualization, which can be used maybe to look into new physics and chemistry. We can do coding in uh, photofragmentation laser induced fluorescence. For example, in the case of hydrogen peroxide, if we want or need to differentiate between natural OH and OH from the photofragmentation, we can do the pump laser structured. Further issues, uh, so far I've described how four images can be uh, visualized. Of course, we want to go to higher numbers. And the group of Elias Christensen and Lund uh, are using uh, special optic elements and devices and have that then increased the efficiency and also the number of frames considerably, showing up to 1,000 images. Then, of course, it's got a, a trade-off between spatial resolution and crosstalk. Uh, we have to have, we want to have a, as wide a bandpass filter as possible to get the highest spatial resolution, but then also we can get contribution from the neighboring image, so it's a question of um, uh, trade-off. So then switching gears a little bit to single ended measurement concepts, and I will try to motivate why this is important. This is a high speed movie recording uh, through an inspection hole, big like this, uh, in a furnace, and you can see the flames. You can also see the um, wall eight meters away. Um, and the question here is would it be possible to make spatial resolved measurements inside this furnace uh, along a line or in 2D? Well, there are some techniques that, uh, in principle, could work. Uh, we have LiDAR techniques, and we have uh, backward lacing. In terms of, of uh, LiDAR, the most common technique is time-resolved LiDAR, which is time-of-flight technique. So here we have a laser, uh, pulsed laser. Send that out uh, in the area we want to measure. Then we detect the backscatter light with a, for example, photomultiplier and an oscilloscope. And then we can see on the oscilloscope when the laser hit the species of interest, for example, soot particles. And then we can convert time to distance uh, so we're, that, what, that we know where this happened. There have been experiments uh, using uh, this technique, uh, but it requires, in combustion, but it requires picosecond laser in a street camera to get the sufficiently high spatial resolution. We also have a one over R2 dependence where R is the distance, and that means that the long distance, the signal is not that high, and you cannot easily use uh, laser induced fluorescence uh, since the, the uh, fluorescence has a lifetime, and that might interfere when evaluating the LiDAR curve. Then we have a new technique for um, uh, in combustion, and that is called the Scheinflug LiDAR which is based on triangulation. And here we have a laser, you can see that here. We have a, a collecting optics and a detector. And uh, then we arrange this according to the Scheinflug uh, condition, which means that we have an angle between the camera lens plane and the image plane. And then we can image a long distance along the laser beam onto the detector so that we have a long field of view. 
So that can give both high Templar result and in focus uh, spatial result data. Uh, we can use any scattering technique, for example, Asian induced fluorescence. And the instrument response is almost independent on distance. Uh, you still have a one over R2 uh, dependence, but that can be is compensated for by a larger fuxel, fi, pixel fo footprint at longer distance. And that means that the pixel looking at the end of the field of view see a larger volume as compared to the pixel looking at the uh, start of the field of view. Uh, some demonstrations, uh, the first one was to just put two candles, uh, one at uh, two and a half meter, the other at three and a half meter, and then the laser hit the wall five meters away, so that is the termination. In this case, uh, a CW laser was used at a high uh, sampling rate. So here, uh, as you can see, there are sort of LIDAR curves during five seconds, a lot of LIDAR curves. In this case, the um, uh, candles are well behaved. They don't change that much in, in time. But then if one of the candles at three and a half meters, for example, is blown out or extinguished, then it creates particles. And then we can uh, diagnose that in uh, space and in time where the particles go. Uh, this can also be used for uh, fluorescence and for 2D imaging. And here is 2D temperature measurement using two-line atomic fluorescence, seeding a small amount of indium into the uh, flame. And this is the setup, uh, two diode lasers probing the fine structure population of indium. So this is the configuration uh, according to the Scheinflug condition. The uh, burner is positioned at the distance of 140 centimeter. And then we can de detect in the backward direction uh, 2D temperatures. A somewhat more uh, applied experience with Scheinflug glider is to test a pole fire. This was done uh, in a pool fire at the RISE, the Swedish National Testing Institute. Uh, here you can see the setup. This is the uh, LiDAR system containing both the detector and the uh, la laser. Here is where the uh, pool fire will be, and this is the termination, eight meters away. And this is how it looks like when, uh, ah, sorry. This is how it looks like uh, when the pole fire is ignited. And then you can see uh, the results. Uh, we can detect scattering from soot and unburnt hydrocarbon. And we can also see the termination echo. This means that we can get the scattering from soot particle, both temporary and uh, spatial resolve, as well as the extinction. Then, of course, it would be nice if we could have a laser in the backward direction instead of detecting a LiDAR curve. Uh, so the ultimate ab ambition would be something like this. Uh, if we have a laser, uh, send it out, and we can get a signal in the backward direction, which would be coherent. We can collect the, the entire signal, and it has no one over R2 dependence. And it, of course, should be spatially resolved. Does such a technique exist? Well, uh, stimulate, stimulated emission uh, might be an alternative, and I will exemplify that. Uh, with experiments on hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom uh, requires a two-photon excitation scheme at two or five nanometers, and that are used normally to uh, look at the fluorescence at 656 nanometer. But here we also induce a population inversion between the excited states. And that gives rise to a laser beam, both in the forward and in the backward direction. This technique was investigated uh, quite in depth in the late 80s, early 90s, but it was not really a success because the spatial resolution was too low. But that was with the equipment available uh, at that time. Now we have much better equipment, uh, la femtosecond laser and street camera. So this is an experiment where it uh, worked to get the spatially resolved uh, signal in the backward direction from hydrogen atom. This was probed in a methane uh, air flame. Here you can see the laser at 205 nanometers, 125 uh, femtoseconds is led uh, through a prism focused into the flame. And then we get the uh, beam in backward direction from the hydrogen atom, which could be temporarily resolved by the street camera. And uh, then we know the speed of light and we con convert this to distance. So here is a single shot distribution in the backward direction of hydrogen atom. 
Uh, I must be honest here, and of course this technique is still unmatured for practical application. It requires advanced equipment. Uh, it's not easy to quantify, but it may be useful, useful with uh, further development. So then uh, turning into phenom phenomenological diagnostic activities, and as I said, I will focus on diagnostics re related to non-fossil fuel, uh, solid biofuel, ammonia, and metals. Um, this uh, are new fuels, and we might have new challenges in quantification, calibration, and measurements of absorption cross-sections. It called for special burner. And Shu Shang Li and Wu Bin Weng has designed uh, and built a burner, which they call a multi-jet burner. So here we have a jet chamber where uh, the fuel and air is mixed. It goes into 181 jet tubes, producing then 181 small flames. And then we have a cold flow chamber where we can add in, in uh, for example, nitrogen or air. And uh, then it produced a very homogeneous and very stable uh, flame environment where the temperature can be varied roughly between 1,000 and 2,000 K just by uh, adjusting the composition of the various flows. So combustion of, of uh, solid biomass. Here we are interested in diagnostics related to heating, drying, devolatilization, and shore reactions. And there are a lot of parameters that we want to measure, uh, species containing nitrogen, sulfur, alkali, chlorine, as well as surface and gas temperature. So for the heating and drying uh, stages, it was interesting to see could the uh, raw scattering be used for gasification or biopellets. Here you can see the uh, biopellets. Uh, when it was, it was put in a cell uh, heated to 700 Celsius, and then Raman spectra were continuously recorded during the heat up phase. Uh, these are the result of the raw data. Uh, this is time, and here are different Raman spectra that are recorded as a function of time corresponding to different temperatures. And you can see in the raw data we have a lot of problems with the backgrounds, the track, uh, fluorescence, or whatever it could be. But then if we use these techniques, periodic shadowing and polarization, lock-in filtering, we can lift off a lot of the uh, background, and that leads to the possibility to actually measure uh, various species as a function of time uh, when the particle is gasified. For the devolatilization de states, it's interesting to measure HCN, and that can be measured uh, using infrared drainer for mixing uh, at uh, 3.1 micrometer. Here you can see where the pellet is introduced into the flame. And uh, then the HCN is measured just a couple of millimeters above and measured as a function of, function of time after the pellet was introduced. And here we can get the results. In this case, uh, HCN was, uh, was possible to measure it quantitative through calibration and knowing the temperature or measuring the temperature. And you can see here is the uh, concentration, and it reaches up to uh, more than 2,000 uh, ppm. It's also of interest to measure uh, gas temperatures and surface temperatures. Um, and this can be done in this case. Uh, the gas temperature was measured using two-line atomic fluorescence, seeding as well of indium and gallium into the flow. And surface temperature was measured uh, simultaneously using thermographic phosphors. So here you can see uh, two views, front view and side view. This is the laser sheet uh, measuring the gas phase temperature, four millimeter above the pellets, uh, where you put a small amount of thermographic phosphors. Illuminate that, illuminate that with the laser 266. Detect the phosphorescence uh, in the time domain and con can from the decay uh, in for the uh, surface temperature of the pellets. So here are, are the results, or some results. Uh, this is uh, in the horizontal direction, the uh, temperature uh, without pellets, and then we have pellets at different times after the pellets was introduced into the flame, and uh, then uh, simultaneously, but this is in, as a function of time, the surface temperature could be measured uh, both in the, the volatilization stage and also in the shore stage, uh, here with using two different um, oxygen concentration in the product gas. Maybe the most important species in biomass conversion uh, is uh, potassium compounds. 
because they contribute to fouling, corrosion, and slagging in biomass uh, fired boilers. Uh, the most abundant species containing potassium are KOH and KCL. That means that we have to, to do our homework to investigate this spectroscopically and also to measure the absorption cross section. And here you can see the absorption cross section, KCL, and for uh, KOH at two different temperatures and at different wavelengths. Uh, here, the multi jet burner was used. And with this information, it's then possible to make 2D quantitative visualization of KOH using laser induced photopragmatation fluorescence. Here we use a laser at 266 nanometer to dissociate KOH to excited state potassium, which then give rise to emission at the 766 and 769 nanometer. And the KOH can be quantified providing we know the temperature, we estimate the trapping, and we account for the quenching. So here you can see the two-dimensional image of KOH burning about the uh, above the pellets. The detection limit here is on the order of uh, 1, 0.1 ppm. And it's also possible to use a laser at 193 nanometer and then simultaneous visualization of KOH and KCL can be done. And that will be presented by Wu Bing Weng tomorrow morning in the session of solid fuel combustion. Then of course there are uh, other species but which are of interest that can be measured spatially resolved uh, in biomass conversion. For example, the total amount of atomic elements can be measured using laser-induced proton spectroscopy. Methyl chloride and hydrogen chloride can be measured with infrared GN4 mixing around 3,000 wave numbers. And it's also of interest to measure sulfur dioxide. Uh, here you can see the absorption cross-section measured for different temperatures and as a function of wavelength. And this is uh, how the spectra look like if excited at the 266 uh, nanometer. It's also possible to do uh, 2D imaging of sulfur dioxide. So then turning to uh, ammonia. Uh, ammonia is of great interest as a non-fossil fuel, despite the pretty low heating value, low burning velocity, and production of, of uh, quite a lot of NO. So what can we in the diagnostic field contribute with? Well, for the major species, drama scattering can be used. And here is a spectra that I got from Christian Brackman and his group showing the spectra that uh, appears in an ammonia flame. And they are also working now on um, uh, minor species, for example, N2O and uh, NO2. Uh, they are very difficult to measure with other techniques, but here it has a, a large Roman cross-section, and with the stuff we have, uh, it's a good promise that these can be measured. Uh, atoms, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, can be measured using two-photon two LIF. OH and NO can be measured using uh, one-photon. Leaf. Then we have other species uh, which are of interest in ammonia, ammonia combustion, NH, that can be measured using one photon, late induced fluorescence, by excitation in the triplet band uh, around 333 nanometer. Here you can see an excitation scan uh, of th this is the experiments, and here is the model, which has a pretty good agreement, uh, and it's also possible to saturate it transition, so it's in principle possible to get uh, absolute number densities. So here is a, a 2D image of uh, NH. Uh, for the flame detection limit, with a 2D single shot using a sheet height of 3 centimeter, it's on the order of uh, 1 over the ppm. Also NH2 is of interest to measure, that can be measured with one photon laser induced fluorescence uh, through excitation in the red region, around 630 nanometer as demonstrated first by Copeland in 1984, or it can also be measured uh, in the UV region around 386 nanometer, as was described by Brackman and co-workers in uh, 2017. Here you can see an excitation uh, spectra of NH2. Uh, this is not noise, it's real structure, but it's much more difficult to model this, uh, since we have a lot of hot band, combination band, uh, which are not known at flame temperatures. So if you excite here around 385 nanometer, uh, this is how the emission spectra look like, which is in the dark blue region. Also here it's possible to do uh, uh, 2D measurements and the detection limit for 2D single shot using a sheet height of three centimeters is on the order of 1000 ppm. Then of course it, it's interesting to measure also the fuel itself, ammonia, spatial result. 
that can be done with two photon late induced fluorescence, uh, stimulated emission, and infrared uniform mixing. But these techniques uh, are not sensitive enough, so that's why late induced, in, uh, induced photofragmentation fluorescence seems to be, be a better alternative. That was demonstrated by Bucklin and co workers in 98, and Shedwick and co workers in 99. And here uh, we use uh, two step photodissociation uh, to photodissociate NH3 to uh, excited state NH, which then give rise to emission at uh, 336 nanometer. So here is an example uh, investi investigating a jet flame, and the aim was to measure the concentration of uh, ammonia slip in an uh, ammonia air flame. Here you can see the flame, essentially emission from NH2. This is the concentration profile uh, above the uh, tip of the flame. Uh, and it reaches a concentration uh, several thousands of uh, ppm. And this was also compared to modeling. Here is the um, experiments. This is the modeling. Uh, we also plotted the chemiluminescence of NH2 here and compared that to modeling. And also the temperature was modeling. So for the flame detection limit uh, for 2D single shot using a sheet height of, of two and a half centimeter, it's on the order of 130 uh, ppm. Then of course it's of, of uh, important to use all this technique for studies of uh, uh, studying different flames. In this case, uh, laminar flames uh, with a mixture of um, ammonia and methane was studied both ex with experiments and with uh, DNS. DNS was uh, made by the group of Shushan Bai here you can see how the flame looks like at uh, three bar. Uh, these are results from NH uh, at one bar, numerics and experiments, at three bar, numerics and experiments, and NO uh, at three bar, also the numerics and the uh, experiments. Here also the uh, distribution at the height of 10 millimeter, the radial distance were uh, plotted. Here is, are the uh, experiments, this is the DNS, that was also compared to 1D flame simulation using different kinetic models. Then it's also interesting to study um, turbulent flame, and since ammonia has a low flame speed and a large flame thickness, it gives a good opportunity to study combustion at high columns numbers, adding understanding of the distributed reaction uh, regimes. So here are two flames, uh, jet flame, which goes up to a column number of 4,700 and more, uh, distributed uh, reaction flame, which goes with up to a column number of 1,000. This is very similar to the burner used by Jim Driscoll and co-workers for studying high columns number uh, hydrocarbon flames. So the uh, diagnostics here uh, were aiming at measurements of several species at the same time, um, at least two parameters. So here are a bunch of lasers and detectors. Essentially, it's aiming at uh, measurements of NH, NO, or OH using laser induced fluorescence, temperature using um, Rayleigh scattering, so the beams are overlapping, and then we have uh, two-dimensional detectors. Some results, these are NH and temperature simultaneously recorded in the jet flame at the highest Colibus number. Uh, this, is, sorry. this is NH and OH in the distributed reaction zone flame uh, recorded simultaneously. And some conclusions for the jet flame, the broadening of the NH layer was up to three, four times at the highest Colovitz number, whereas for the distributed reaction zone flame, we didn't see any broadening. So the characterization of flame regimes uh, is dependent on fuel, bur fuel and burning configuration. And tomorrow, Leilek Su will give a paper on modeling of these two flames, describing the differences in behavior. Then we go into uh, metal combustion, which has received a lot of attention during the last year. There's been a lot of work going on uh, at McGill University by the group of uh, Jeff Burgesson, and here is just a uh, review paper from that group. It's also an innovation center created in Eindhoven by the group of Philip de Goy, which is called Metalot. And uh, burning metal has a lot of interesting features. It's carbon dioxide free. It has a high energy, uh, larger than most common uh, fossil fuels. It's safe and simple to store and transport. It's abundant in the Earth's crust, and particles can be generated and using renewable electricity and reused. And then, of course, we have uh, diagnostic challenges. We want to do high spatial resolved diagnostics 
on or close to micron-sized burning particles where we want both temperature and species concentration, uh, eventually both in two and three dimensions. Uh, we have new species, new species uh, where we under have to understand the spectroscopy. Uh, if we have a lot of, of uh, particles in the flame, we might run into multiple scattering and laser induced breakdown. And it's of interest to me measure particle morphology and how that changes in time. And in this field, we have done some digital inline holography for measuring the particle size, 3D location, and velocity. In this case, a CW laser is used. It was, the beam was shaped up using a spatial filter sent to the frame with the burning uh, iron particles and then detected with a high-speed camera. Then the hologram were evaluated and we can get the uh, particle size uh, measurements uh, in three dimension and also the velocities. So, uh, then we come to the um, industrial and practical application of laser diagnostics. And then we run into special uh, challenges. Uh, very often we might have high pressure, which might influence, which, might, which will influence the line shapes and increase quenching effects. We have to understand that. Uh, we man many times have limited optical access. Uh, we have a, a soot environment, uh, which can lead to laser-induced breakdown, laser-induced incandescence, which of course is of interest if we want to measure soot properties. Otherwise, it could be a problem. Uh, and we could have a massive knee scattering. Often we have to use practical fuel, diesel, uh, jet A, where we can run in extinction trapping. We can have laser-induced background fluorescence, for example, from large hydrocarbons. And we can also have photolytic effects, for example, creation of uh, C2 emission. Very often we have to use windows, uh, which can give rise to scattering, they can then be damaged, and we can have fouling. And then, uh, of course, we have to transfer all this equipment. Uh, both the lasers and the uh, power supplies are bulky. That's why most of our lasers are on wheels, as you can see here. And they also have to be transported. That's why we have a truck that could go to the place where we want to apply this. And uh, there are some uh, examples. Uh, the burst laser system was uh, transported from the physics department to the Department of Mechanical Engineering to study uh, ICCA, ICCI engine at high speed, uh, visualizing the formaldehyde as can be seen here at 100 kilohertz. Uh, then a slightly different uh, engine is a ship engine. And here the uh, group of Matthias Rister went and with the aim to measure surface wall uh, measure the surface wall temperature measurements in a mar marine two-stroke engine uh, using thermographic phosphors. Uh, and that was done at MAN diesel and turbo in Copenhagen. And here you can see the um, pressure and the uh, temperature as measured at different crank angle degrees. Then we maybe have the ultimate test for laser diagnostics, and that is a jet engine. This is the engine that normally sits in the Swedish fighter, Jaws Gripen. Uh, here it's in maintenance at Volvo Air Corporation in uh, Trollhättan. I don't know whether you have been close to a jet engine, but this is really a monster. Uh, in terms of acoustic vibrations, noise, uh, the whole building is shaking. So our ambition here was to see, would it be possible to measure uh, slip or remaining fuel after the afterburner, when the afterburner goes from zero to 100%. Uh, here, a Jäg laser is used, uh, focused with a cylindrical lens that we uh, create a divergent laser beam, and then we detect with the ICCD. Uh, remember that this is a very hostile environment, so we have to put both the Jäg laser and the detector in uh, very protective uh, boxes, otherwise they would shake to pieces. Uh, and here you can see the results. This is when the afterburner goes from 0% to 100%, and you can see emission of fuel in the outer region up to roughly 60%, then it stops. Uh, another interesting um, application is to do measurements in gas turbines. Here is a picture from on-site experiment at Siemens Energy uh, in Finspong. And here we have uh, uh, the high-speed laser, the tunable laser, and the uh, camera, which is protected uh, for, for the heat of the burner. The aim is was here to measure uh, OH, PLIF, 
uh, when the hydrogen was um, changed from zero to 80%. Here you can see the single shot, and this is the probability distribution uh, maps. Uh, of course, it changes when you increase the uh, concentration of hydrogen. But this is very important for the company to understand what happens when you uh, increase the hydrogen. So they have a lot of interest in this, and they are using this um, as um, uh, to use a model valid validation, model validation uh, in-house. Then uh, we might want to do experiments in furnaces. Uh, this is the full-scale 75 megawatt uh, biofuel boiler at Jordbo outside Stockholm. And the aim here was to measure temperature using cars. Uh, here you can see the two views on the furnace. Uh, in the upper here, you can see that you have uh, two, probe, two probe openings. And in one of these openings, we uh, guided the laser beams, focused them in the middle where temperature was measured, and then an optical fiber uh, was used to transport the cost to the detector. And in the other inspection hole, the company th themselves put a suction parameter uh, to, m to measure temperature. And then we could compare the results from the uh, cars measurements and the suction parameter. This is uh, how the results looks like for the suction parameter. You can see that it's uh, around 3, 13, 40 Kelvin. It's pretty stable in time. You have time uh, down here. And then if you compare with cars, we get roughly the same average value, but we have a much larger standard deviation with a lot of, of events um, at lower temperature and also at higher temperature. Uh, and this is, of course, important because the company are using ammonia to inject and, and um, uh, reduce no NO. And that works in a certain uh, temperature window. And uh, as you can see here, uh, a lot of the events are outside this window. So they were very interested in this. So then we start to reach the summary, conclusion, and future. Uh, I might be biased in this, but it's clear that laser diagnostic techniques are of great importance for combustion characterization. It's important to be able to work with fundamental spectroscopic activities to assure that we have good accuracy and precision in our data, and also for development of new techniques. Uh, it's also important to have a close coupling between modeling and experiments. Uh, and it's also important to face what I call real world application. So if we look a little bit uh, in the future, uh, the field will greatly benefit from development in new lasers, detectors, and optics. And just to give a historical perspective on that, uh, I show two figures from the proceedings in 1973. Uh, to the left, uh, the group of John Pont Theron aimed for 2D measurement of cars, uh, of course with limited success with the equipment available at that time. Uh, but then 40 years later, Alexis Boulid and Chris Cleaver uh, used the femtosecond laser and adequate cameras and showed very nice results. Uh, to the right, Dan Hartley had an idea how to visualize molecules in 2D. Uh, he thought of uh, Raman spectroscopy, and that's why he called it ramanography. Uh, so he thought that uh, if you use a, a laser sheet and an image intensifier in a camera, you would be able to get the 2D image of uh, the species. Uh, then 10 years later, planar laser induced fluorescence was uh, presented by the group at uh, Stanford and at SRI. And in the same year, uh, Tudor Raman was visualized uh, by Marshall Long uh, and his group. So in the future, we might get access to atosignal lasers. Uh, we might get new sensitive detectors based on uh, uh, superconducting nanowires, at least in the infrared spectral region. Uh, we I'm pretty sure we get new optics based on metamaterial. This is a very interesting field. And we get access to large infrastructures, uh, free electron lasers, and also x fields And we get uh, spallation sources for neutron scattering. Some diagnostics needs, well, I think that we need um, better precision in our 2D single shot temperature imaging. It would be nice to have 2D velocity measurements without particles at low flow speeds to complement PIV. It would be very interesting to measure spatial result, concentration, and temperature in dense media in a, inside a burning pellet spatial result. And maybe a combination of ultrasound and laser scattering 
and an ultra narrow spectral filter based on spectral hole burning could work. Very promising and interesting results uh, are right now taking place in the medical field where they uh, spectral result can measure inside tissues. Uh, it's also that we need um, increased spatial resolution in high pressure environment to understand the details of uh, combustion. Then, uh, what happened now? Okay. Uh, so then we have uh, is a, essentially a diagnostic toolbox uh, containing lasers, uh, equipment, and um, I can't see here. Something happened with my computer. Okay. Uh, this toolbox can at, uh, be used in uh, different environments, for example, in uh, medical uh, application in, uh, I have to fix this. I start all over again. I'm sorry, something happened. So, finally. Well, I don't know what happened. I have to read this. Yeah, we can use this for, for different applications. Uh, indeed, in the uh, right side of that, there's a flat application, material synthesis, environmental mon monitoring, uh, I'm sorry, uh, catalysis, industrial and ecological and uh, medical application. So, uh, then I have a couple of minutes left and I could maybe say a couple of words on uh, collaboration uh, with different fields. You know, I have a background in physics uh, and uh, when I uh, got my PhD I thought, how could we collaborate with others? Uh, and then as you can see here, we run into some problems uh, because we didn't speak the same language. Uh, so we had a hard time to communicate. Um, and if you can't communicate, of course, it, it's difficult to have a, a close collaboration. But then we worked on this uh, and uh, see whether it would be possible to get, uh, create a network where it could, we could combine basic science, engineering science, and applied science uh, with the aim to uh, get scientific excellence with industrial relevance. And uh, neither of these basic of sciences sort of solved the uh, challenge to collaborate. So we have to have something else. And, and uh, here I've written social science, which is not, of course, correct. It's not science, but it's about uh, social communication, uh, which is important. And uh, we have worked with this for several years. And uh, uh, there are some items which you consider. Uh, this is based on personal experience. Uh, I think it's important uh, uh, that we have a sustainable collaboration and that cannot be uh, forced. All scientific areas should be regarded as equally important. It is essential with mutual respect, trust and confidence between colliding partners. And it's also to make sure that gains, success, credits, failures are equally distributed. You know, we win together and we lose together. And uh, we have seen that the creation of meeting places is very important. Uh, we can have coffee together, we can afterwards together, not necessarily uh, discuss science, but we can become friends and then we can, uh, of course, collaborate much better. So then it's possible to uh, overcome this gap and instead create what I call a development bridge between the different disciplines. And uh, this way of working has been very fruitful 
uh, awarding for me personally, and I would certainly not be here today uh, without this collaboration. Uh, so that's the, why the next slide is the most important slide I have, and that is the acknowledgement of all the uh, members, present and past, in the Division of Combustion Physics who have in, uh, contributed both directly and indirectly, uh, and of course all our colleagues in the Division of Fluid Mechanics, Combustion Engines, Heat and Transfer, Fire and Safety in Lund, and Madi, many other groups uh, in other countries. And of course, this wouldn't have been possible without the financial support from the Energy Agency, uh, European Research Council, Knut and Alice Wallerberg Foundation, Seacost, and the Research Council. And by that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Sorry for this mess. So thank you very much, Marcus, for this great overview, this perspective, and as well your personal, uh, let's say, tips and implications for the collaboration we should uh, uh, deepen in our future work here. So I would like to thank you for this great and inspiring talk, and uh, hereby I would like to hand over you the certificate for your HODL lecture. Okay. So, Marcus, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.